it has been published. Huh? Full local resection followed by a suture. Type C, you have seen type C1. Call extrusion, extraction through parent vessel followed by a suture. Call extraction through fundus followed by a clipping type C2. The lessons, the lessons are important. Lessons, avoid before. Vitruvi, wait a little bit more because this fundus coil extraction is still a little bit tricky and you have to wait for B1 or B2. And regarding C, C1, there is a controversy. Some people told me, and it is a comment, a comment in the neurosurgical public, neurosurgery publication, they said you could have placed the patient on antiaggregant and anticoagulant during six months. Okay, it's, it's okay. we can discuss. And uh, for C2, the lesson is, if you have to do that, you have to do, to do it very fast. Thank you for your attention. Never, because since that time, since we have to be that, uh, that, uh, that classification, no, we are waiting for type A, type B1, type B2, B3, B4, we avoid that, but I said that, but there is a case waiting us in the, my department with someone for embolization of a giant vertebra artery and a giant pica, giant basilar artery, and this person is is paralyzing because the aneurysm is still growing. So I think we, we should do something and probably we will try that. But I think the coil is still in the aneurysm. So if you place a temporary clipping in the base of on the parent vessel, we should avoid the coil going into into the into the flow. But do you put the temporary distal to the end of the Very often. Because it is going to very often, yeah. But I had a patient which had a point on a I've tried this act like you said. Yeah. But there was this one stuck huh. at the base. Uh, stuck, so that means it was adherent to the... Yeah. yeah. We did a post-clipping ICG which showed very good for this study. Yeah. And still the patient had been stroke. I couldn't understand what the other happened. So that's what I was asking. Mm -hmm. Thrombus? Thrombus or probably the temporary clip was a longer time. Yeah. Sometimes the perforate has may have been uh, included in your temporary clip. Or... Yeah. Do you think a lot of these sidewall recurrences, sidewall aneurysm recurrences will now be treated with pipeline devices or pro diverters rather than going to surgery? I think a few of them, but it's the reason why I, I was I was pleased to show you that even with a stent and a recoiling, you can have recanalization and compression of the brain stem. So uh, I think, and the vascular is is there, will be, we stay there and will be, and will develop. So for neurosurgeon, the aneurysm will go down. But I think I see we have just checked our results using that strategy since 20 years in my department. And we have seen that the results of the endovascular, and we have two very good endovascular radiologists, and their results are now stabilizing. I think that we have to wait for something very, very new in the endovascular world, but so far, the result and their problems, and they're using a lot of anti-aggregant, a lot of anticoagulant, there is hemorrhage, hemorrhage during the procedure, hemorrhage after the procedure. And so a very well neurosurgical team, well trained in vascular surgery, is still now can do better than endovascular 
uh, radiologists. So the, the future is for them. Us, we are a little bit, with our technique and, and tools, a little bit stable, but for them, but now they are also stabilizing. But I think the future they will find some kind of tools uh, that, can, that can, can place in the vascular close completely the neck and uh, it, will, it will be done. It's the reason why I'm not only a vascular surgeon. Like the case that you showed for paracular aneurysms and uh, record after collagen, most of these will now be treated with a pipeline uh, uh, code yeah. and device. Uh, and but the results are excellent. Yes, but you have seen all the complications related with the pipeline? And 10% intraoperative complications with pipeline. 10%. You, 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 you do that by a well trained vascular surgeon, you do not have 10% complications. So, in France, 95% of the aneurysms are coil, and even recurrence are called coil for France. They have lost vascular surgery. But in other countries, Germany is. But it's a problem between France is no, and very sad that there is no France representative. In France, no, the medicine is well controlled by the state. So, it's so difficult to click this thing. Why I will bother? Why I will stress to do that? I let the end of the, uh, the vascular do its job. In Germany, for example, or in Belgium, there is still a place to to congratulate the surgeon who has done a nice job, and so he feels if he, he, he feels a little bit pushed to do the nice job because. But in, in France now they are so socialist. <laughs> I just want to make a comment now. Um, uh, I work in England, you know, the I said was done. Yeah, I'm interested. In UK, I think that it was a very uh, limited trial because the cases selected were grade one, grade two. And if you look at this, the number of cases, the MC illusions were very, very few now. And, and what you were showing that the indication for calling should be for four grade patients, which I think benefit more. Second point was that uh, it did not compare clipping versus <coughs> the new devices. There's no study comparing web devices, for example, or food diverters. We don't know what is the uh, better result in the long run. So, yeah, no, I agree with you. And I, so, but I'm, I'm, I'm very junior and not in that. In general, uh, the field is going towards MMR. I mean, nobody in this deny them. So my feeling is that the neurosurgeons will go the vascular surgery, the next generation neurosurgeons who want to do vascular surgery will go to vascular surgery. And that's happening in India, uh, in the US. You have said that they will disappear. No, they would do both. I do not think so. I think because I think to perform an endovascular procedure and a clipping procedure it's two different worlds. And tomorrow, if I have a problem, I would go to a pluridisciplinary group, and I want them to have a guy who do part-time endovascular, a part-time clipping, clipping part-time. No, no, no way for me. I do not believe in that. Japan and China is a great situation because we have 3,000 women of the endovascular among the neurosurgical society. So the research younger generation can do both. So they can decide the, uh, even the uh, night duty time, so they can, they, they can decide by themselves. So once the uh, it's then they come to the endovascular. I'm very really interested to see the results of that. Uh, regarding uh, your strong statement, I think uh, probably may not be true because a surgeon who is uh, also uh, trained to do endovascular probably in a, in a better position to decide in a given case 
what he thinks he will be able to do better rather than uh, referring to another person whom he, that person may or may not be able to do it. Because if he thinks that he is able to do it, he will do it. If he thinks that it is problematic, he may go for the endovascular thing. And the endovascular is again rapidly changing. The technologies are changing every year. So, the reason why you should be a specialist in endovascular procedure and the surgeon should be a specialist in specific surgery. Going into the to the skills for me is very difficult. Going to the endovascular is very difficult. Personally, I think that every one of us alone is dangerous. We have to work in a team and in a team with the best endovascular and the best surgeon discussing together. It's the future for me. And the results, I'm, I'm ready to bet on it. The future will probably won't be there. But I think that the results will show that the best is to work together inside, inside of both technique inside one person. The endovascular medical department go everywhere in the body. He do that every day. The surgeon who are a surgeon is operating three days a week, four days a week, two days a week. Now you will start to do both techniques. Which percentage you will have a bias, a bias for one of the two techniques? I've I fully agree with Jeff. I think this is what the worry is. If one person decides which one should be coiled and which one should be clipped, how would you, uh, if you had a complication or if somebody decided to be wrong, how would the different is that? If it was done by two people or one person. And you are protected. Why must you clip the thing? Very important. Yeah. I, I, you know, in, in our team, we have at least uh, six neurosurgeons who can do both the open surgery and the intervention treatment. So sometimes it's uh, very difficult for intervention treatment, like uh, uh, older patient. The vessel is very tortured. But the normally, this kind of patient is very easy for open surgery because of the shrink of the brain. So there's a lot of space to, uh, for you to open the uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, and uh, actually, my opi opinion is uh, uh, when, when you are a neurosurgeon, you shift to do the both. Actually, the neuro-intervention treatment is very, very easy for neurosurgeons. Uh, for neurosurgeons. You know, the intervention achievement, you just uh, need uh, maybe one year's train, train, then you can do very good. Actually, <laughs> it's a pity that we do not have endovascular radiologists in the room. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because now we, among us. Now in China, we have yeah. more and more hybrid uh, yeah. rooms yeah. and uh, operating rooms, so we, we can uh, do uh, that. In the hybrid, uh, if we uh, coiling, there's some we have also that, but we the, the endovascular will call by for the same the, the, yes, by the I understand that. I understand that. But on average, how much a Chinese surgeon is working per week in the OR, operating, operating, how much day? One, two, three days? No, normally five, uh, uh, five days. You are working five days in the OR every day? Yeah. So, okay. You are a hybrid vascular surgeon. So, on average, you perform 50% of your time and the vascular 50% of the time is taken. No, no, no. Uh, maybe uh -huh. For me, only uh, 20 percent of the time is taken. Fifteen, one yeah, five. Fifteen yeah, yeah, yeah. percent. So, do you think that you are as good as? An endovascular radiologist who is doing 100% of his time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, I'm better than that. I think I'm better than that. Because, you know, we, uh, we, can, handle, we can handle all the complications. So, so yeah, yeah, if the, if the uh, coil, co coils collapse and uh, uh, accrue the ICA, I can do the bypass immediately. Yeah, and, and uh, actually, uh, our complications is uh, less than the neuroradiologist. Yeah. So two things. Uh, there are 
results of Tiffin's specialty is doing endovascular treatment, which has already been published from the US. They have compared neurosurgeons, endovascular, and neurologists. And almost 30% of people doing interventional treatment now are neurologists. In the US, in India, a lot of people do or neurology do endovascular treatment. And the results have been published and they are equivalent, they are no different from the other people. So that's been published and there obviously there will be more. And the second thing is uh, of course there are no absolutes in this world, so you can have your word. So, absolutely. <laughs> No? Yeah. It's epilepsy surgery now. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. called the uh, Yeah. And there. So nobody wants to read. Nobody wants to read. Yeah, we really want to do it. Don't worry. It's also muscular. Yes, uh, very nice to hear you. Our next is uh, basically epilepsy surgery. Really brilliant. A vascular neurosurgeon can do epilepsy surgery also in this stage so nicely. Our first paper is on vertical paramedian hemispherotomy. Yes, please. So, as I have the opportunity to present you different uh, techniques regarding epilepsy surgery, I will integrate it, my talk together so that I think it will be more didactic if I allow you. Yeah, yeah, sure. So you, you can stop. Uh, how much time do I have for all the communication? Yeah, you have got 30 minutes, but you have to stop. minutes. Everything. 45 minutes. Okay. because it's connected to the cloud and so that uh, because I speak Dutch in Belgium and so sometimes Dutch, sometimes French, sometimes English. It's funny. title surgery for medically refractory epilepsy and I must say that I have a, a colleague who is uh, from Brazil and who is a guy who has uh, supported me in developing that program since uh, now 50 years it's Dr. Gerard Dovin so I would like to stress his contribution to this work. So we have two main types of epilepsy surgery. 
The first type is investigational surgery, and the second type is therapeutic surgery. So the investigation type in this one is essentially to place intracranial electrodes. And we have two types of intracranial electrodes. You see the ICA intracranial electrode. We have the subdural electrode, this very, very flat electrode. And we have the intraparenchymal electrode that we place using a frameless technique. You see that, for example, a mesotemporal intraparenchymal electrode placed using a frameless technique. Here, the subdural electrode, we have developed what we have named the letterbox technique. Uh, using the letterbox technique, we can place through very uh, length uh, opening in the skull strips and grids uh, inside uh, the, the skull below the, the dura matter. We have published that in neurochirurgy. So you see the MRI post implantation. This MRI is really important because we are we are now locating each electrode on the cortex so that the epileptologist will be able to identify the foci of the, the seizures. You see here different kind of intraparenchymal electrodes. Now we are placing more and more intraparenchymal compared to the subdural, and we are using this system from Brain Lab, it's the vector vision system, and you see this kind of thing help us tremendously to place the electrodes intraparenchymal very uh, in multiple locations. But we try to do that orthogonal. The patient with the intracranial electrode go to the EEG video room, and then we have this video, we have these registrations, which goes to the pluridisciplinary group, and we discuss together, is there a room for therapeutic surgery? So we go for the therapeutic surgery. The therapeutic surgery can be divided in four big areas, resection, disconnection, stimulation, and destruction. It's incredible because all this technique you now can be so effective by reducing, by stopping completely the seizure that for your patient it will be important. So the fissure, cingulate, subparietal, anterior part of the calcarine fissure here, the collateral fissure really important, and the renal sulcus, which is the prolongation of the collateral sulcus into the renal sulcus. And for what I will show you, the piriform lobe. What is the piriform lobe? The piriform lobe is a, a lobe, it's another lobe, which is formed by a part of the limbic gyrus and of the intralimbic gyrus. It is delimited by the optical tract and the anterior perforated area. Very important not to go there because the risk of hemiplegia is very high. It's limited laterally by the collateral sulcus and the renal sulcus. Because I will use all these names in my movies, there is a posterior virtual line, and you have inside this piriform lobe different substructure. So again, Majorly and superiorly optical tract, anterior perforated area, laterally, inferiorly collateral sulcus, renal sulcus, and inside these two limits, you have the anterior area, Broadman area 28, also named in the French literature area tempesta. You have the pre piriform area, which is formed by the ambient gyrus and the anterolateral area to the lateral of olfactory sulcus. You have the ankle sulcus with the prolongation of the hippocampic fissure. And inside you have the ankles properly and the periamygdaloid area. The periamygdaloid area is really important because it's the last step before going into the anterior perforating area. And people doing neuro-oncology, for example, said that when you see the perforant 
of the anterior perforating area, most of the time your patient is already limited. So, when anatomically you can see the periamygdaloid area, it's a good time to stop your resection. So, resection. Resection, there is also four subtypes of resection in epilepsy surgery. Resection of a lesion, a tumor, a sclerosis, of a NMD, NMD is the acronym for Neural Migration Disorder, resection of a part of the cortex, resection of the lobe, of part of the lobe, part of the lobe I mean a selective amygdala hippocampectomy, of all the lobe, resection of the hemisphere, it's horrible to see that, it's horrible, so I do not perform any of these things, I perform disconnection instead of resection. So, example of a lesion, which, which was a epileptogenic, you can be very precise and you, you, you remove the lesion. You can use different techniques as when you have an infiltrating tumor, which is epileptogenic, you can remove everything because there is tumor elsewhere. You perform a methylene scan, a methylene PET, and so you will be able to remove the high-grade part of the tumor by surgery. And during using, for example, this technique, which is the diffusion sequence of MRI, you can see the pathway of the vision and remove the tumor, the, this lambic tumor, avoiding the projection of the visual pathway. To perform a quality control of the resection, especially in neurology, we are using, since 2006, this hybrid room in which the patient can be put into a 3-point Tesla intraoperative MRI to check the quality of the resection and, if necessary, to add a second time. Second part, resection of cortex. The, the epileptologist says to you, you have to remove this part because they are the foci of the, the seizures. And we do that using neuro navigation, and you see that you can perform the left on the left hemisphere just before the Broadman area 44. The Broadman area 44 is the posterior part of the broca area, is the is the, the the region where you cannot go except using another technique that I will show you in a few seconds. That's an incredible technique that we have to this also in your surgery. So, resection of a lobe, part of all the lobe. I told you I do not do resection of all the lobe. I perform the connection, but here, resection of part of a lobe of the lambic lobe is the selective amygdala hippocampectomy. You can also resect the temporal lobe, it's the anterior temporal lobectomy. I don't do that, I do, as I told you, this connection. The amygdala hippocampectomy selective resection. It's a wonderful structure. We have to say hello at Piazzagin because we have developed that to a transylvian uh, to the transylvian tissue. I have more than 100 cases of transylvian selective amygdala hippocampectomy, but I, I show you my evolution. Selective selective amygdala hippocampectomy transylvian transcortical. You can choose. Enlarge with an anterior temporal disconnection. It's really classical. So, the transylvian approach for a selective amygdala hippocampectomy, Yazargil 85, you see the principle, the resection is there. You have to be very elegant, and here I think it's uh, for a vascular surgeon to go through the trans uh, uh, lateral fissure. It's an easy job, easy. It's, it's, a, it's a normal job, and you have to open the lateral fissure, keeping the venous drainage on the temporal lobe, and you open the temporal pole. I won't show you a movie of one of these way. I will show you something else. It's what we have developed simultaneously with the French uh, team. I saw what you can do. You leave very often a part of the amygdala against the optical tract, 
And you see the quality of that resection is really a selective amygdalo hippocampectomy. This is a part of the parahippocampus gyrus, and this is the collateral surface. So a result at at least one year after surgery is 89% excellent result, 70% result with an angle grade one. So we went for a trust one through the Broadman Aratory 8 node to perform this selective amygdalo hippocampectomy. And it goes faster. It's what I named the Kio selective amygdalo hippocampectomy, trans T1, and you will see the surgery. Using the navigation, I will perform this selective amygdalo hippocampectomy through a 10 millimeter opening in the anterior part of T1. <clears throat> so the first step is to use the CUSA to have access to the temporal bone. You have here the volume of it. Uh, no, I'm on the Ammon's, Ammon's horn, and I, I take a piece of the true hippocampus, but this, this part of the hippocampus is named the Ammon's horn by analogy to the horn of a, of a Greek and Egyptian god, anyway, it's anatomy. And now one very important uh, landmark is the hippocampic fissure. Because the hippocampic fissure is inside the Ammon's horn, and I will remove the para-hippocampus and, and up to the collateral sulcus. You can see the less, the following landmark is the corridor fissure with the fimbria. I removed the Goldman area 28, which is the anterior part of the parahippocampus gyrus. You have seen the hippocampic fissure there. So I'm removing now the anchors past of the piriform lobe, just above the renal sulcus, but no, just above the, the ancal sulcus. And my resection will be finished when I was, I will be, ah, here, the choroid plexus is there, the fimbria, the, the white band that you see is there, with the cusa, I, I kept the fimbria, which is the efferent pathway of the hippocampus, and you see very well the hippocampic fissure, there you have seen the choroid plexus, and I will show you the notch of the temporium. The notch is there. There is the ambient cisterna. I will show you the PCA. Where is the PCA? The PCA, the projection is there, but we should be able to see the PCA through the, the arachnoid. Yeah, the PCA is visible. Oh, no, it's the oculomotor nerve, this one. And uh, I show you the end of that surgery. It's very fast now. I put a plug to avoid the subdural collection, and I will show you that the size of this opening is 10 millimeters to perform a selective amygdala hippocampectomy. The complication discharge on the fifth postoperative phase. Hemisphere, hemisphere is disconnection and not resection. So I spoke about resection. I will speak about disconnection. You can perform intracortical disconnection. It's an incredible technique made by the French surgeon. A multiple superior transaction, MST. You can disconnect a lobe. You can disconnect two hemispheres by a callosotomy, or you can disconnect a hemisphere. The first one, the MST, intracortical disconnection. The principle of that technique is to do that with a very small hook, a microscopic hook. You will disconnect all the transverse connection between neurons inside the cortex. You do that like that parallelly. It was a technique. And you keep intact the vertical connection to the thalamus, to everything else in the encephalus. 
But the problem with that technique is that you have to perform one puncture for each sub-viral transaction. One puncture for each sub-viral transaction. And it can, provoke, uh, it can provoke some problem. The technique has been developed to have access to all primary areas of the cortex. Broadman area 4, Broadman area 44. You see here, the, it's the Broca area. You have here the primary area, post-central. You have here the Renike area. You have here the supramarginal area. And you have here the angular uh, uh, area that I also named the Einstein area because in the brain of Einstein on the left side, this area was bigger than the average. No, you know why? Because this area is the location of your capacity to compute and to calculate. <coughs> you see that what we can do with the MST on the left side, it's a publication of SRAM. The big problem doing like that is, before showing that, the results. Excellent outcome. That means angles one or two in two cases out of three. Excellent outcome in two cases out of three. But the problem is this. When you do all these multiple transactions, with one puncture at each section, you can have this big problem, this edema. So we have developed the radiating MSP. This technique has been also been published in neurosurgery. And you see a case of Lando Klefner. Lando Klefner is a patient who has the focus of uh, epilepsy located on the Broca area. So the Broca area is always in a state of seizure so that the person cannot speak because of the epilepsy. And you see, you will see what we can do. I'll show you our technique performing MST. I start all, always by the less dangerous area. And here I started post centrally on the ascending parietal gyrus. And you see the technique, the radiating MSP. And each section, you have this very small hemorrhage along the section. But it's one puncture for three, four, or five uh, transactions. No, I'm performing the MST on the frontal ascending, as ascending gyrus, Broadman area four, primary area of the motor on a person who can move both both uh, arms and legs. I try to coagulate every puncture to avoid the subarachnoid hemorrhage, but you see that here we have already a little bit of subarachnoid hemorrhage. So here you have a lot of transaction here, the danger because of this radiating, we have less, less bleeding into the SES. And now we place the subdural electrode, which is analyzed by the epileptologist. And the epileptologist told me that Christian, we still have the discharge on the Broca area. You have here the lateral fissure. You have here the precentral sulcus. You have here the ascending ramus. So this place is the Broadman area 44. This place is the triangular gyrus, is the Broadman area 45. And I'm performing my MSTs on the Broca area on the left side, on this lady who cannot speak since two years. Since two years. Okay? So the lady after surgery, we ask her to speak, and she started to speak with, his, with her hand because she was used to do that since more than two years. I know they are speaking. It's incredible. This girl was able to speak since more than two years. And the face comes back like that. The brain is extraordinary. So, our published results, performing MST alone, performing MST with another technique, and you see that we have a 75 to 80% significant result. 
I mean by that a decrease of more than 50% of the seizure rate. But what's important with that technique is that the PND, permanent neurological deficit, it's only 3.2% and minor compared to a meta-analysis uh, reporting that using the parallel MSP, you have up to 23% of PMD. So no, disconnection of a low. More, very often we perform disconnection of the frontal low. You see here an example of a disconnection of the temporal low. It's really disconnected. A callosotomy, you cannot super, you, you can, you can super, uh, yeah. Uh, two hemispheres using that technique. I won't show you that because I will show you that in the fourth point is the hemispherotomy. The hemispherotomy is also another word. The hemispherectomy is doing that. You remove the telencephal, keeping intact the thalamus, the subthalamus, and a part of the basal ganglia. Hemispherotomy is like that. But the beginning of the history of the hemispherotomy, tummy, it's through the transcilian or around the lateral fissure. I'll show you a case. A eight month, eight month baby. Since the age of one month, this child had 100 spasm per day. No visual contact since her birth with her parents. The name of that disease is Otara syndrome, also named better, early infantile epileptic encephalopathy. <clears throat> and you see that child. That child is like that since the beginning of her life. No contact with her parents. It's non-stop. And each spasm is uh, epileptogenic discharge, epileptic discharge. And uh, this disease was related, you see, I had at that time the MKM, December 2000, it was my first case. Pediatric neurosurgeon. And the purpose here, the first cases I, I did was going through the lateral fissure to disconnect the hemisphere. And I will show you what is incredible. After, after that, performing that kind of uh, disconnection, the first day after surgery, the child looked in the eye of her parent. Yeah, it was, for the parent, it was a rebirth. You see the child with her left hemisphere, because six months after the hemispherotomy. She can move a right uh, arm. The big problem is always the hand. The, the hand will be the part of the body which will recover the least. Six months after the hemispherotomy, you will see that this limb doesn't move a lot, but can move six months after surgery, without, without left hemisphere. The child can stand on her legs, but it's not. And 13 years, 13 years later, but Look at the right hand, fortunately for her, she is very, very dexterous with her left hand, and she has no left hemisphere. But very rapidly uh, evolved to the vertical parasagittal hemispherotomy developed by Delalande in 92, well published in 2007, and now I have 20 cases of vertical parasitical hemispherotomy, and I will show you that on the right side. It's the best way to analyze the limbic structure, the limbic system, because the disconnect 
and hemisphere, you have to go everywhere. The procedure, we have modified the technique. The procedure starts by a cortectomy. Cortectom I have already cut the, the yellow of the corpus callosum. I show you the fornix. I show you the foramen of Monroe. I, I disconnect the rostrum of the corpus callosum following the anterior cerebral artery. And I stop my disconnection 10 centimeters from the foramen of Monroe. So the genu and the rostrum has, have been disconnected. Is the first part. The second part, what you see now, I'm going down to the posterior part of the gerus rectus on the right, the gerus rectus on the right side, to start my deconnection of the frontal, the frontal lobe. So you see my position. No, I'm moving my microscope to go posteriorly and to perform the disconnection of the splenium. The splenium has been disconnected, and I am here on the great cerebral vein. I balance my microscope, I go to the floor of the trigon. You have seen the corrugated plexus. I identify the cruise of the fornix. The cruise of the fornix is there. So I coagulate the, the plexus so, so that I will be able to work and to disconnect the floor of the trigon. I start my disconnection from the splenium going through the floor of the ventricle. You see there through the arachnoid, the ambient system. The ambient system is there. And now I'm starting the posterior to anterior disconnection going through the putamen. It's the most difficult part because the putamen, it's the putamen or the lateral capsule or the extreme capsule is is well vascularized, and I will follow the floor, the, the plafond, the roof, the roof of the temporal pore. Uh, 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 Here you have the thalamus with a part of the basal ganglia. I have already initiated my trans, my disconnection through the putamen, and I will go up to the puriform lobe in the depth of the disconnection. So you see that it's bleeding, it's bleeding, but you have to be very careful. You have to, to have a perfect hemostasis. You see the, you have seen the hippocampus, you see the hippocampus, and now there is a last piece between my resection of the gerus rectus and my resection of the lobus piriform. I complete my transection and remain there, the thalamus. If I have a problem with the thalamus, the patient won't, will not away. You have here the hippocampus. I have also disconnected the fimbria. I'm doing a check regarding the hemostasis because the first complication of that surgery is the hydrocephalus, acute hydrocephalus. And I'm, I have closed here my open. So you will see our results. Who are uh, in press, it's Saint Luc, the name of my hospital, 2018. We have 16 cases. You, say, you see no mortality in the theory of the Lalande, 3.6% mortality. Rate of VPS, ventric kiloperitoneal shunt, 14%. We have only one, 6%. And what's, what's the most important thing here is the seizure outcome. Angle, I think it's good. Wow. Angle swan, 92% of our patients are in angle swan. No seizure more, anymore. And it's uh, very comparable with the best results published in the literature currently. So I will finish with the stimulation. You know a little bit of it because I speak about deep brain stimulation. Two, two worlds for the stimulation, peripheral, vagal nerve stimulation of deep brain stimulation. Hello. Peripheral, you see the technique. It's done by one colleague who has uh, now more than 150 cases of vagal nerve stimulation in my department. You see the electrode, negative electrode, positive electrode, uh, anchor titer. You see the location of the left 
most of the time the left vagal nerve, and you see here the electrode right beside a vagal nerve. Alors, chronic electrical stimulation of the vagal nerve. What can we rate with that? Belgium is the last financially supported to treatment. Only for PCS, that means partial complex seizure. The, physiopath, the physiology of that technique is we think that through a chronic electrical stimulation, we have a GABA release in the central nervous system retrograde through the vagus nerve. The side effect of that technique is dysphonia and the effectiveness. 20, not, not very effective, only 23% and 3 months. When I say effective, that means seizure rate decrease of more than 50%. Only 23% at 3 months and only 43% at 3 years. Is the reason why the deep brain stimulation appears, but you know the story now. I already spoken about that. So the last piece is radiation, <coughs> especially developed by the team of Marseille, uh, by <coughs> uh, our friend Regis. The technique is, and I think it's a, it, it is also a lot uh, used in China. Uh, they are using the radiosurgery to perform selective amygdalo hypocarpectomy through radiation. <coughs> the problem is this one. This technique radiation has a particular timeline. No improvement during one year. If you are an epileptic patient, you know that there is a mortality risk associated with each seizure. So during one year, no improvement. One year, later, one year later, after the treatment, the aura can increase. You can have a gadolinium enhancement because the blue brain barrier is ruptured by the radiation. And the angles one and two is around 70%. You have seen that selective amygdala hypocarpectomy is above 90%. But Regis said, published in Journal of Neurosurgery, I think, that with that technique, they have no verbal degradation that we can see with, with, with uh, surgery. But I know why, because the tests are done just after surgery. And in this case, as the effect of the radiotherapy is very slow, the control are done one year after the technique, so that the brain has, has adapted itself to the treatment. The risk is the tumor transformation. We have one case this also in your surgery regarding a tumor transformation in a patient treated by radiosurgery <coughs> and finally the patient was still operated because she came into your department because the tube the tumor vascular tumor compressed a brain a brain stem and she had to be operated on in emergency so I would like to conclude my lecture by telling you that epilepsy surgery is a wonderful area. You have seen investigation of epilepsy <laughs> surgery. Is, uh, it has become more minimal invasive and very precise with a very low level of complication. And regarding the therapeutic world, the epilepsy surgery is effective in up to 90% of the cases with a permanent neurological deficit of only less than 5%, and when you do that kind of surgery, it's really a surgery during or with which you can propose a rebirth at your patient. Thank you for your attention. Excellent lecture. We must congratulate you. Really,